Praise the Lord, everybody. You're making your way to your seats. I want to welcome every one of you to Wednesday night service at the River Bend. Looking forward to what God's going to do. We're going to open the service by prayer tonight. I believe God still hears and answers prayers. He's still on the throne. I want you to remember my family, my lost loved ones, my wife tonight, please. Anybody on my right-hand side have a request? Hey, Brother Kevin, unspoken. Brother Jill. Okay. Middle section, Sister Eloise. Okay, Sister Margaret. Okay. On my left, Brother Shannon. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sister Nadine. Amen. Amen. Let's take these knees to the Lord tonight. In Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. God, we're so thankful for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. God, we bring our needs before you tonight, God. Knowing you're the one that we turn to, knowing that you're the one that we depend on, God. We release faith in this place tonight, God, knowing that you're going to hear and answer every prayer, God. According to your will, Lord, these that need delivery, God, I pray, God, that you reach down into their life, God. You deliver them, God, from whatever is hindering them, God. Whatever they're addicted to, God, I pray, God, deliverance in their life, God. That prodigal that's walked away from you, God. All lost loved ones that need you, Lord. I pray, God, that you bring them back, God. We're believing, God, they're going to walk back through that door, Lord. God, we ask you, Lord, that you have your way. Touch these that are sick in body tonight, each and every one of them, God. Let your healing virtue flow, God. You took those stripes for our healing, God. Lord, we lay you clean to it tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
song uh we started it practicing it sunday morning and i've listened to it every day on the way to work and from work because honestly it just makes me feel good <laughs> and um the first part of the song says i've got a song to sing might not be on key but it's from my heart because no one else can tell it what the lord has done for me so it might take a minute but I got something to say. <laughs> um, I know Gigi's talked about it a lot, that one day he's going to let everybody that's had stuff happen to him since we start saying that prayer say something. Well, I texted him before church, and I have a piece of paper because I wouldn't remember it all if I didn't write some stuff down, and I'm sure I missed some, but I've started texting him every week. Something new has happened to Richard and I, and... Before I even go any further, I know we say it's not magic. The prayer's not magic, but my faith has grown. That's why this stuff is happening. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you that obviously COVID put a damper on a lot of things, a lot of people's finances, a lot of people's jobs. Uh, Richard and I, obviously, that's right after we had shut the store down. And so I was at home for one month. And uh, Richard and I were at his grandparents' property digging some dirt uh, to put in some flower beds. And his phone rang. His boss said, hey, I just want to call and tell you, you're getting a raise. And I was like, okay. I think it was a week later I got a phone call that not only did I get a new job, but my dream job. So not just a job. What I love to wake up and do every single day. Not only was it my dream job, I was making double the money I made <laughs> prior to. Uh, I really can't even tell you guys how many raises and stuff Richard's got from then to now. Um, a couple weeks ago, his truck tore up. And if you really truly know me, I am a cheapskate and I don't like spending money unless I want to spend it. Other than that, I don't want to spend it. Richard's truck will be paid for in August. So I was excited. <laughs> and uh, it messed up. The first time they told us it was going to cost $5,000 to fix it. And I was hot. <laughs> uh, then they called back and said, never mind, it's $1,500. Then they called back and said, never mind, it's $1,300. I was like, well, I can deal with that over $5,000. And it had the check engine light was coming on. I don't. I can't tell you car stuff, so I don't really know what was wrong with it. All I know is it was making Richard shut it off as he was driving, and if that tells you anything. So uh, we just prayed for it. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, I don't want to pave it. This truck's been a good truck. Just let it run. I'll take 150,000 more miles. Just let it run. <laughs> but my specific prayer every time I prayed was let that light go off. Just let that light turn off on the dash, and we won't have to worry about it. Well, the light has turned off 
and the truck has not one time made him stop to turn it off. They ain't making no noise, and it's ran ever since we prayed for it. So we didn't even have to get a new motor. They were telling us we had to get a new motor. We don't have to get a new motor. The, the second thing, this is the most important to me, without airing too much of my business, uh, I had something wrong with me. And to be honest with you, I don't know what it was. It was health-wise, I'll tell you that. And what it was, there was physical evidence that something was wrong with me. <clears throat> and uh, not only that, my nerves were shot because of it, because I had already convinced myself I was dying at 27. And uh, I was getting myself so worked up, I was like throwing up, like I was having a lot of anxiety issues. And uh, no one knew about it. And uh, Richard obviously did, but finally I texted Gigi one day and I said, I need a prayer cloth. He said, okay. And then later he said, who's it for? I said, me. He said, okay. So there, that is how much conversation transpired between me and Gigi. I sleep with it in my pillow every night and I carry it with me to school. And what was wrong with me is gone. Has not happened one time since I've got that prayer cloth. And not only that, I cannot tell you the last time I got worked up, my nerves. No, and if you truly do know me, I can get worked up pretty quick. <laughs> so last week, I went to go pay our water bill. First of all, our utilities are outrageous. Just going to tell you. Y'all think New Madrid's are bad. Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. But uh, my water bill is always $70.00 always two people seventy dollars i went to the mailbox got my water bill was sitting in the parking lot writing my checkout and uh when i got to the mount part it was seventeen dollars and 68 cents and i was like oh that's interesting so i went to the city hall and i said this is wrong and uh she said well let me check on it and i started clicking on her computer and she come back to the window and she said i don't know what to tell you but it ain't wrong i don't know what happened but merry christmas <laughs> And I said, well, I know what happened, but I'll, you know, it is what it is. I'll take it. So it wasn't even a third of what it's supposed to be. Then Monday, Monday, Richard got a bonus. Today, he got another bonus and a very significant raise. Not only that, I have also got both of those things. Where I work in a profession that that doesn't typically happen. So I'm saying all that to say this. It's not magic, but when you decide to let God take care of everything, He takes care of everything and some. So I'm going to lead this prayer tonight. And if you want to look at me, you can, because it works. <laughs> so if you guys will stand with me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, saints and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, let's lift him up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Praise God. I thought as Sister Meredith was speaking tonight, talking about what God had done for her, my thought just kept running over in my mind. God is faithful. God is faithful. And I'm so thankful. So thankful for that. Amen. All the children come up front, please. Children's church. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Oh, we got a good looking crowd. Kids tonight. and lead us back there, sweetheart. Praise God. Praise God. Is anybody here? Is anybody here? Praise God. Praise God. River been ignited. You're dismissed also. I like what I feel here tonight, don't y'all? Man, it feels like church. That's what it's supposed to feel like. Amen. And thank you for being here tonight. Very grateful for uh, the uh, the church. Uh, um, got uh, uh, 25 Bibles uh, from the Gideons and gave them out and put a, in memory of Daddy in them, Gary Lynn Keene Sr., in them for my birthday, and I'm thankful for that. As, as we said, it's 25 years since he passed away, and uh, 25 years ago today was his funeral, and it was a Holy Ghost holdown. And uh, um, then uh, they uh, they bought me a, a new leather backpack because that's what I carry all the time, everywhere I go. I sometimes get made fun of about it, but because I know I look goofy carrying my backpack, but I just like it. And they bought me a real nice backpack I'm thankful for. And then last night we had a great time. And uh, I'm so thankful for all the fellas that came and went to Hickory Law with us. And, and we got plenty to eat. We even had some left over, didn't we, Brother Ray? Just didn't know it. Boy, Brother Ray saw them ribs in the bottom of the pan. You couldn't see them by looking. He said, oh, goodness, man. I believe I'll just get me another one on the way out the door. So I grabbed, I got peer pressure on me, and I just got me another piece of brisket on the way out the door. But uh, uh, I'm thankful, thankful that you're all here. I'm thankful to be here, thankful for this church and uh, um, for the blessings that the Lord has shown us. Um, hallelujah. Um, the bait of Satan. I found out when I was in Maryville, um, that's the church that's, uh, I, one of these days I'm going to show you all some slides and stuff from that church but uh, they call it the Maryville Miracle um, brother brother Terrence brother Larry's on the other side but brother Terrence can tell you uh, they got nicer stuff than our school has in some cases 19 million dollar facility and they moved into it debt free don't owe a penny on it it's incredible. And the, the key to that is giving. They were trying to raise money for a building, and the Lord spoke to the pastor and said, instead of saving that up, give it to missions. Start giving to missions. And they support missionaries. They're, they're the assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the same message as us, but they support their missionaries, UPC missionaries, WPF missionaries, independent missionaries. Anybody comes along and needs help, they bless them. 
And uh, that opens up the windows of heaven. That's the way God's financial plan works, is when you give, you give God permission to bless you. And it's not always in greenbacks, but it's always a blessing that's for your favor. And uh, you, you can't outgive God. You just can't outgive him, I'm telling you. And I appreciate Sister Meredith sharing that with us. And, and uh, uh, we got a lot of them stories. I get a text message almost every week. And, and almost every week, too, Brother Blake, we have a new one of our online church start giving almost every week. And uh, so uh, uh, don't be surprised when God opens up the windows of heaven and everything we've preached and taught about starts coming to pass. Don't be surprised. But I found out that they use the bait of Satan as requirement for church membership over there. It's part of their discipleship. Uh, it's part of their discipleship uh, pathway that you've got to go through the bait of Satan in order to, I don't say join the church because that's not what we're talking about, but you want to be connected, um, be used, you got to go through it. Well, it's not a surprise to me. Why? Because this is loaded. And uh, this, this thing is loaded. And tonight we're going to a little bit different place in chapter 10. I, I hope, did anybody read chapter 10 yet? I did, I did. Oh, we got three, four, five that did. Uh, um, it ain't going to do you no good if you don't read it. Okay, because I can't cover it all here. And if you've got the book, read the chapter. Y'all ain't that busy. I got a little green dot on my Facebook friends too. Y'all know what that means, don't you? Uh, that you're on there. Yeah, if you got on Facebook and you didn't read your chapter, you got your priorities out of whack. Come on, somebody. Huh? I ain't being ugly. I'm just being truthful. Okay? We've got to put in some effort. Can somebody say amen? amen. You've got to put in some effort. You ain't going to have debts demolished sitting at home on the couch waiting on God to do it. Uh-huh. All right now. You've got to put out some effort. So, chapter 10, lest we offend them. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you look at this from a carnal perspective, you will be offended. Just going to tell you flat out. You will be offended. You'll be upset. Your feelings will get hurt. And you'll probably get mad at me. It's the truth. You, can't, you cannot look at this. Matter of fact, we got to get to a place where we don't live any of our life from a carnal perspective but spiritual. You got to believe that when you go to work, you're going in the Holy Ghost. You got to believe that. Now, Jesus offended some people by submitting to his calling, his purpose, and fulfilling the will of God. We learned that the last Wednesday that we met and had the bait of Satan. All right, I appreciate Brother David teaching on the, the whole armor of God last uh, Wednesday night. He did a great job. He always does. And uh, we appreciate that so much. Uh, you will offend people with truth. Just the way it is. Because the carnal man is wired to go against the Bible. Okay? You know, when the devil told Eve, the Lord just trying to hold you back, he knew exactly. He had the hook set. And he's reeling her in. Because he just caters to our natural wants. Okay? Now, Jesus never caused anybody to be offended in order to assert his own rights. Never. The only people that got offended by Jesus Christ were offended at the truth. And the fact that they couldn't put the truth in their box. Okay? Okay? Romans 14 and 13 in the New Living Translation says, So let's stop condemning each other. Just let it soak for a minute. I want us to seek for deliverance from condemnation being our default. Okay? When you walk into somebody's house, 
Look for the prettiest thing you can find and focus on it. Don't look for cobwebs in the corner. That's an oversimplification, but you understand what I'm saying, right? So let's stop condemning one another. The King James says, let's stop judging one another. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Pretty straightforward. All right? Pretty straightforward. Now let's wade off into the introduction. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Now I want you to know that this tribute is a temple tax. Not an offering, but a temple tax. It was instituted by the Jews and the Romans liked the idea, so they just picked it up and made it a part of the taxes. All right? It's a temple tax. And Peter said to them, yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, which means he just, just confronted him. And he said, what do you think, Simon? Of whom do the kings of earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? So who does the king or the Caesar, or the ruler, who does he tax? Not his own family, but the people out there. Those in the house, they benefit from the tax. Peter said unto him, of strangers. So it's, it's of just regular people that they would tax. And Jesus said unto them, well, if that's the case, then are the children free? Now this is going to make sense. So here's what I want to explain to you. A king does not tax his children, but they benefit from the taxing of others. Now, whose house is the temple? God's house. So then, the Son of God does not have to pay taxes. It's going, we're going somewhere with it. But... Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. So he said, Peter, go out and not a net, but throw out a line. They probably more like a cane pole. They was fresh out of Zebco 202s back then. But he put a line on a pole and threw it out there. He said, the first fish you're going to catch is going to have money in its mouth. He said, take that money and go to, this. this I'm not going to teach on it, but it's, it's got something there. He said, and go take it and give it to them for me and you. It's going to be both of our temple tax. Now, Jesus was the authority. He was the king. He was the creator of the world, and he had no tax to pay. He knew who he was. Can I get an amen? amen? Get that inside of your head. He knew who he was. But rather than cause an offense to anyone, he made a way for Peter to catch a fish, and when Peter got that fish up out of the water, there's going to be money in his mouth, and they would use it to pay the temple tax. This was a miracle. You agree? Think about it from this perspective. It was divine provision designed to ensure that there would be no offense. God intervened to make sure nobody would get offended because Jesus and his disciples did not pay the temple tax, even though they didn't have to. Jesus did offend people, but always with the truth in the process of fulfilling the work he came to do. We learned that last week. Do not temper the truth to keep from making somebody mad or hurting their feelings. Preach the truth. But he never offended anybody in the process of saying I've got a right to do that. Never. He was Lord of everything. 
but he took on himself the form of a servant. The freedom of Jesus Christ, hear this, because it works for us the same way. The freedom of Jesus Christ was established in his knowledge of who he was and what his mission was. He had no desire. I love it. I feel the Holy Ghost. I know the Lord's directing us. He had no desire nor inclination of any kind to validate himself at the expense of somebody else. There was found in him no, everybody say no, no. words or actions motivated by selfish pride. You couldn't find it in Jesus anywhere. He had, hear me right now, as I feel the anointing flowing in here, he had nothing to prove to anybody because he knew who he was. If we get it down inside of our mind and our heart that we are the children of the living God and to be born again of the water and of the Spirit puts us uh, into the family that carries the name of salvation of Jesus Christ, uh, then we will eliminate uh, probably 90% of the battles we fight. He knew who he was. That's why he drew in the dirt. That's why when they brought that woman taken in the act of adultery, he didn't say a word, just began to minister to people because he didn't owe anybody anything, Brother Blake. He didn't owe them an explanation. They said, what do you say? What do you say? Law says killer. What do you say? He said nothing. Have you ever been there when somebody, when you know, I read this the other day, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Let me get it come back. Peter did it. Peter, the Bible says he said something because he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to do. So he just, blah, 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 blah. you know what I'm talking about? When you start feeling that pressure and you start feeling that anxiety, right? I just got to do something. I got to say something. So just, you know, praise the Lord, pass the purple peas <laughs> or whatever. Okay? Jesus didn't roll like that at all. He did not operate under pressure. Okay? He didn't. And that enabled him to be who he needed to be because the pressure from somebody else will force you into a place you never were supposed to be in the first place. But when you're walking in the will of God, walking in the power of the Holy Ghost, led by the Spirit and not by the flesh, you don't have no pressure. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. That sounds appealing to me. That sounds appealing to me. Ooh. Look at the next few verses. Matthew 18 and 1. Here you go with the King Kong dummies, the disciples. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What was the warning I gave you right at the beginning of this lesson? Oh, I know they're going to get offended. That wasn't a warning. Don't think with the carnal mind, but with the spiritual mind. Because if you think with the carnal mind, you're going to get your hackles up. You, you are, I promise you. They said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What did they want the answer to be? Me. You are. But the problem with that, I'm, let me wait a minute because I'm fixing to give you the problem. Jesus called a little child to him. And he set the little child down in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You ain't going to heaven full of pride. To be converted and become as little children, this is just one little example, and several people have shared videos with me, but a little child, I've had it happen before. 
They don't know because a person smells bad, they ain't supposed to love them. You've got to teach a child to be prejudiced. They'll reach for anybody at the store. You'll be carrying them along like looking at people all crazy and stuff like, boy, I hope they don't breathe on me. Next thing you know, you, your, your child is done turned on you, leaning over your back, reaching for them. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever had that happen to you? You know, that's what the Lord's talking Oh, I, I do, man. I feel the anointing in this place tonight. God's going to rattle somebody's cage and change your world. He said that's what you got to be like if you want to go to heaven. You got to be like a little child. Verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The key phrase is, Whosoever shall humble himself because it throws the responsibility for humility upon the one who desires to be the greatest. Okay? Now, if I ask you right now, is it okay to want to be the greatest? Most of us, in light of what we've seen, will say, well, no. The Lord got on to the disciples' part all the time. Right? Remember that? From the looks of things in the context, it is not wrong to want to be great in the kingdom of God. You just got to know how he defines great. Now, how did they define great? Same way we do. In the eyes of this group. That's it, Brother David. They defined great as I'm better than you. I'm more important than you. I've got more influence than you. Who do you think they've been following around for all this time? That's not the example that he gave them, but that was their mindset. And the truth is, the Lord wants us to be great in the kingdom of God. But he just wants to be the one that defines greatness. Huh? Huh? Oh, that's a problem because we like to be seen. We like to be bragged on. There's nothing wrong with patting somebody on the back and telling them good job. There is something wrong about hunting for it all the time. Okay? All right? We got to get the right definition of great as defined by God and then shoot for it. Go there. Being great in the kingdom of God is not really optional. You got to be. You got to figure it out and want to pursue greatness in the kingdom of God. Okay? Because it is elementary to being used of God. You can't be used of God until you're positioned appropriately. Okay. When you have humbled yourself, you're not looking for glory. You want the glory to go to God. And glory, when viewed through the lens of this lesson, is not having your name in light, so to speak. But you know what the glory that he's talking about here is? Here we go right now. It's the opposite of being obedient. The glory is Burger King style. Have it your way. That's the glory they're looking for. Okay? It's asserting your, asserting your will and your desires to whatever extent it's necessary. Please understand this right now, Brother Marcus. You are exactly right. We're about to be offensive. Because we're waiting off because the truth is I need the situation to be whatever it can be so I can be in control. That dog don't hunt in the kingdom of God. Doesn't. It doesn't. How can I help you? That needs to be the phrase on our lips more than any other. 
How can I help you? Not how can we do this and end up I get my way. Because if I can't get my way, I just won't help nobody do nothing unless I'm in charge. Y'all hear crickets? It's something we need to be delivered from. Sister Maria, he said, humble yourself. You know what that means? Purposefully join myself to somebody else who got something going and say, how can I help you? Even though I know I want to be the boss. I know I want to be in control. And let me tell you this, I know I can do it better than you. But I'm going to say, how can I help you accomplish what you want? You know what that's called? Humbling yourself. Well, I'm doing all right because I ain't getting that many amens right now. All right? Because I'm trying to figure out how I can somehow work the will of God in and still have my way. Because I like it my way. Well, do it your way at your house, but this one belongs to him. Again, we're talking about a carnal viewpoint versus a spiritual one. The disciples don't even know what greatness is. They think it's Grand Slam in the bottom of the ninth and everybody carries you off, puts you up on their shoulders and say, Shannon, Shannon, he's our man. If he can't do it, nobody can. That's what we want. That's what we view greatness as. Okay? He doesn't do it like that. A couple chapters later, Jesus is still dealing with this prevailing issue of the disciples and their ego. And he goes a little further on this principle. Matthew chapter 26, we're going to look at the last phrase. He said, but whosoever will be great among you, what does that mean? But go to but right here. But whosoever will be great among you. Who is, what's that saying? No. They, if you want to be great. If you want to be great. Here's how you do it. Let him be your servant. Let him be your minister. Wait on somebody. If you want to be great, this is the formula for it. Greatness is clearly defined. Whoever among you will be great, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you. That's not just great. That is what? The best. At the top. Let him be your servant. Say, so, well, exactly how do I know what that is? I hoped you would ask. Because the next verse says, even as the Son of Man, who that is? Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve others. He was the Son of God, and he had complete liberty and complete freedom to do whatever he wanted, wherever he wanted, with whoever he wanted. And what he chose to do was submit himself. Even when it was evident that those who came against him were ignorant of who he was. He did not bow. Remember, that's what was happening in the garden. I got to stay up here because the camera's just right here. So I really want to get out there and stuff. But I'm going to stay right here. Remember in the garden, Judas and the mob came to get Jesus. You know, Brother David, he did ask them, do y'all realize how dumb you look? 
Y'all came out here with this big old crowd with sticks and staves, and I've been in the temple every day. You could have had me anytime you wanted me. And then he calls Judah's friend. Called him friend, Brother Blake. You talk about humility. And then Pedro, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. Chief dummy. He said, I'll fix this. Whoosh. Pulls out a sword. And he wasn't as good a swordsman as he thought he was because he cut off an old boy's ear. I promise you to goodness that ain't what he was aiming for. He was going to decapitate that rascal because I done told the Lord, I'll die with you. Let me prove it. See what's happening, Brother Kevin? Peter still don't have a clue in the world what it means to be great because if he would just open his eyes, it's right in front of him. If he would have just opened his eyes, greatness was right there. He said, cannot I presently call down 12 legions of angels to save me and they'll be here? You see, he knew who he was, Brother Blake. He knew who he was, but he said, there's a mission bigger than me winning. God, hear, hear, hear the word right now. He said, I got a mission bigger than winning this fight. I got something more important to do than winning this fight. Oh, my Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong in this place right now. They didn't have a clue who he was. Because Brother Shannon, the Bible says if they would have known, they would never have crucified him. But you want to know why they crucified him? Because he wasn't great. Because if he would have come on a horse with a sword and a great army as a ruler, as a king, as somebody they could be proud of on the as somebody they can be proud of on the earthly stage, they would have accepted him because they were looking for him. And they said, he can't be him. He's just a carpenter. He's lowly. He's a servant. A low-life carpenter. But his glory, well, hear me now, was not to be found in belittling or diminishing anyone, even an enemy. His glory was not. The reason, Brother Marcus, that his glory wasn't in there is he was already high as he could go. Oh. You know who he was? Let me tell you. He told him before Abraham was... I am. Let me tell you what, Sister Nadine, you know what? They understood what he was saying because they've been hearing the stories for years and years and years of that old Moses said, who do I tell them send me to set you free? He said, tell them I am that I am has sent you. And Jesus declared himself as I am. You know who that is? Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the ending, the first and last, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. He could not be glorified any higher than he was by being who he was. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot be glorified any higher than what he lifts you up. So let's stop fighting amongst one another. Because even if we win, we ain't won nothing. Say, who are you talking to? Just the church? I'm talking to the whole cotton-picking world. Yeah. Fighting about stuff that don't amount to a hill of beans. Right. Just because we want to be right. Yeah. Brother Billy, I've seen people that was a Cardinal fan get into it with somebody that was a Cub fan and fall out and not even be friends no more. 
I've seen them fuss and argue if LeBron was greater than Michael Jordan to unfriending one another on Facebook and, and meet me out the dam and we'll get this settled just right. As if me beating up Brother David is going to make Michael Jordan greater than LeBron James. You understand, it ain't even about them. It's about I got to be right. Has anybody else ever had that happen to you before? Feel old Ned start rising up in you? Because somebody dared violate your, your sense of what was right? The next thing you know, you're wanting to fight them. And nobody even knows why anymore. That's right. There you go. He was I am. And he knew it. And he knew it. And there was no glory in proving the Pharisees wrong. There was no glory in proving Pilate wrong. There was no glory in proving the disciples right. Oh, listen, when he come in riding on that donkey and everybody waving palm branches and throwing their, you know what the disciples were saying? It's about cotton picking time. Really? He's finally who he was supposed to be. We knew it all along, but it just didn't work good till everybody else knew it too. And then a week later, he's dead. And they go lock themselves in a room somewhere, all of them sitting around, twiddling their thumbs, going, what do we do? Okay? Are we all right tonight? Okay. We're on liberated to serve now. Galatians 5.13. Paul says to the church at Galatia, let me tell you what the church at Galatia's problem was in a nutshell before I go any further. They received the baptism of the Holy Ghost like everybody else did. Okay? And then they decided they could mature on their own without the Holy Ghost. Paul said, are you so foolish that you began in the Spirit, but now you think you're going to be made perfect by the flesh? You know what that really means? Thank you for the Holy Ghost, Lord, but I got it. I got it from here on out. I'm smarter than them, richer than them, better looking than them, drive nicer cars than them, live in a nicer house than them. We got this. That's what they told him. He asked the Galatian church, he said, who did hinder you? You started off so good. Boy, you were blowing and going from the jump. Let me tell you what. It, they did not know what it meant to be great. Paul said, for brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Now, John Bevere says, and I agree with him, that that word might be better translated, you're privileged, you're blessed. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose, remember that? You are the church built on the rock. You've been called to liberty, but don't use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't use that liberty to make yourself look good. Because your only motivation in making ourselves look good is to make somebody else look bad. And that doesn't work. That's displeasing to God. But by love, serve one another. We are not to use our liberty or privilege as children of God in order to serve ourselves. We are called through the knowledge of who we are in Jesus Christ. That's why I forgot what step it is. They all run together in my mind. But this recovery stuff, folks, the whole church is in recovery. Every last one of us need recovery. And the very first principle of celebrate recovery is I had to learn I'm not God. All right, I'm helpless. I am weak. I can do nothing by myself. Hope you don't get tired of me talking about that because it ain't stopping. Because it's true. 
Every last person in here right now needs to go through those steps. Ain't that right, Sister Maria? Because after we've been around a little while, we start thinking that we just might be right there with God. He said, don't use your liberty or privilege to puff yourself up, to help yourself. He said, but by love, serve one another. And that can be nothing less than serving our brothers and sisters in the same manner that Jesus Christ did. Because love is what makes us like him in the world. First John chapter number four. Because as he is, so are we in the world when we know and believe he is who he said he was. And that includes they love not their lives unto death. That includes, I want you to think about this. Jesus said it. Because we think that we know what the greatest love is. Oh, I got the best relationship with my wife of anybody in the world. That's the greatest love there is. Oh, I love my children more than anybody else loves their children. That's the greatest love. I buy them everything they want. You know why we call that love? Because that's what the world says. You know what we, why we talk about our, you know, the Bible says, I'm going to let you unpack this. You just think about it what you will. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You know who your friends are? They're not your husband or wife that you got to love. They're not your children that you got to love, but it's somebody you chose to love. It's somebody you made a decision to be connected with and to build a relationship with. And when you lay down your life for them, it's the greatest love. I thought the greatest love was between me and my wife. That ain't what the Bible says. That ain't what the Bible says. It's perfect love. It's love just like Jesus. Because guess what? He laid down his life for some scallywags. But he called me his friend. When I was still a sinner... Many have referred to the tenets of the straight gate and the narrow way as bondage or legalism. Not so. Call it whatever you want to call it. The Lord said that's the way into life everlasting and few there be that find it. You want to know why, Brother David? It's because they cannot move into the spiritual mind. Because the book says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they shall be called the sons of God. You can't be led by the flesh and still be a child of God. But we keep on trying to do it, Brother Blake. That's what this whole chapter is about, is we still keep on trying to do it. As if the Lord will get frustrated with us and say, Fine, just do whatever you want to do then. That's what we do. But we better learn to be different. When you're in bondage, you're a slave. Now there is a litmus test of sorts to determine our perspective of this life lived for God. Yeah, I'm causing trouble tonight. I know why I am. I ain't scared. I want to. I want to because I, I get these lessons before all of y'all do and just almost every one of them's got something in it that goes sideways with me. But I know what the truth is. And it ain't me. It's him. And I better get, Brother Ronnie ain't here tonight, which is, I didn't know he wasn't coming, so I'm going to get on to him later on, but...
That's just funny. But he always talks about being in alignment. That's an incredible concept. We got to get out of alignment with the world and into alignment with God. And it's going to seem foolish to everybody. I'm going to keep moving and grooving here. It's a litmus test to determine, is this life lived for God bondage? Or am I committed and submitted servant of God? Is this something I do because I'm just scared not to? And that I hope I get to heaven and find out I could have done whatever I wanted to. As if you're going to care. He said it's a straight gate and a narrow way that leads to life. But there's a, a big broad way and a wide gate that leads to destruction. Listen, I don't mean to be ugly, but anybody with one eye and half a brain can tell you that the life lived that reaches to heaven is going to have to be much more rigid than the one that goes to destruction. Anybody can tell that. Slaves have to. Servants get to. Boy, I have to go to church tonight. Is that a fact? I can't honestly can't tell you when the last time was that I thought I was too tired to go to church. I can't tell you. I can't wait to get here because of you all. That's why I get to be here. Slaves, are you ready for this? They do just the bare minimum that the master requires. But a servant stretches herself for the maximum. Slaves only go one mile. Servants go the extra mile. Here we go. Regarding giving, slaves feel robbed. Servants give. Slaves are bound. Servants are free. Here we go. Carnal versus spiritual mind. Slaves fight for their rights. Servants willingly lay their rights down. Hmm. If we think we need to fight for our rights, then we do not know the truth that sets us free. Absolutely, state of mind. For sure. For sure. He said, I, I made myself a slave. Yes, it is a state of mind, 100%. Yes, sir. Do what? Uh, that's a good way to look at it. That's a good way to look at it. David did that. I don't want to wait off here too much, but David had this down. When Absalom went and won the hearts of Israel, remember that? You know how Absalom did it? Anybody ever read that? He said, you deserve to have a king that cares about you. He said, if I was king, I'd fix your problem for you. Okay. And you know what? They bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. You want to know why? Because we like that stuff. I like when it's all about me. I get my feelings hurt and my lips stuck out when I don't get picked. But when if I'm picked, rain on the rest of you. Think about this just a minute. Hezekiah. This is true. It's in the Bible. You can read it for yourself. Hezekiah got healed by the Lord. And the king of Babylon showed up at his house and he wanted to congratulate him on being healed. And Hezekiah opened the door and said, step right up. Come on in. Okay? And he showed him everything he had. He showed him throughout the palace and the man of God came along and said, hey, bud, what's going on here? 
He said, oh, man, the Babylonians came and they showed everything. He said, let me tell you something. You just let the fox in the hen house. He did. Oh, he said, it's going to make your sons eunuchs. You're going to be slaves and servants to them. And you know what Hezekiah said? That's all right. As long as it don't happen in my day, I'm good with it. He said it. You read it in there. So, yes, it's not mine anyway. But as long as it's good for me, whatever happens, happens. Huh? Did we get uncomfortable right then? It's in the book. It's in the book. You know what David said when his wise men came and said, man, you take Absalom out. It ain't no problem. He ain't got as many people as he thinks he does. And besides that, all the mighty men are still on your side. You know what David said? Let's pack our stuff up. He said, we're going we're to leave the palace. He said, because if it's Absalom, it ain't going to work. And if it's God, we can't fight him anyway. Maybe my time is up. That's what he said. Come on, David. We write songs about you, bud. Matter of fact, we built you up so much that the other guy, God killed him. He said, ah, it's all right, man. Because it ain't mine anyway. I was just a, I was just a shepherd boy. When the Lord reached down and got me. I didn't ask to be king, but he made me king. And if he wants me to stay king, guess what? I don't need a palace to be king. I don't need a palace to be in the hand of the Lord. Matter of fact, oh, I'm preaching to somebody right now. I've been in the wilderness before, and I made it out all right. I've lived in a cave before, and I made it out all right, because you know why? The hand of the Lord was on me. Huh? It's the truth. It's the truth. We're fighting battles that there is no winner. All right, I got to get out of here. Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 8, Paul has to deal with an issue that has the potential to divide the church. See, during Jesus' ministry, he tore down some of the long-held tenets of the law especially the dietary aspects of the law. There were many foods under the law that were considered unholy, the most common of which was pork, pigs. But there was a lot of other things. They couldn't eat catfish. Did you know that? Yep, didn't have no scales. Couldn't eat a fish, didn't have no scales. Couldn't eat a rabbit. Yep. Shoot the cud. Okay. A lot of different things you couldn't eat under the law. Jesus comes along and tells them, let's get something straight here. What you eat ain't the problem. That's what, the, that's what he says to the Pharisees. He said, what you eat ain't the problem. He said, because you're just going, I'm, I'm not being ugly, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. He said, you're just going to eat that, and then you're going to go to the bathroom, and it's going to be gone. He told them that. He said, the problem is what comes out of you. Because out of your heart comes envy and strife and, and all of those other things. He said, that defiles you. So, Jesus established that all foods have been made clean for the believer. And what they ate didn't defile them, but what came out of their heart defiled them. Now, the Corinthian church was a revival church. They weren't perfect. They had a lot of problems. And one of their main problems was they had a whole bunch of factions. All right? One says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, and another says, I'm of Christ. And Brother David, they only said that to try to elevate themselves above the other. They had a problem with that. But then they took it to a place where the Lord got involved. Here's what it was. Much of the meat they ate was purchased in the market. Now, does anybody know where it came from to get to the market? That's exactly right, Brother Robbie. They worshipped all different kinds of idols, and they would kill a critter to sacrifice it to another idol, and when they got done, they'd wrap it up, take it to the market, and sell it. All right? That's just the way they lived. 
the Corinthians, uh, they didn't have no problem eating that meat. And it was all right because they were a little bit more seasoned and they understood things and that, that, that God they offered them groceries to ain't even no such thing. He ain't real. They didn't do nothing but just get us some more handy, easy, ready-to-go meat. It's true. And it really was true. It wasn't a big deal to the Lord. He didn't have a problem with that no more because there's just one God. Baal's not a real God. Ashtoreth is not a real God. Chemosh is not a real God. Sacrifice it to who you want to, but then I'm going to put it right there on the table when you get done with it. And that's what they were doing. But they had a problem. They were a revival church. And they were winning a lot of new folks. And some of the new folks they were winning yesterday was, guess who? The ones offering sacrifices to them of dumb idols. And these new worshipers saw these elders eating this meat that had been offered to idols and it upset them because they knew what it was. Brother David, they haven't matured to the place where they can say, man, that ain't even no real God anyway. But it was real to them. They just come out of it. They just started worshiping the true God and they still have some inclinations they haven't matured yet. They're babies. Can somebody say amen? amen. You see the picture? Yeah. All right. They were offering those idols yesterday, Brother Shannon, and now they're in the church worshiping the living God, but they look over at the supper table and there's the meat they killed yesterday offered it for an idol. That didn't sit good with them. Y'all seeing what I'm talking about? Okay. Paul dealt with it very wisely and very clearly. 1 Corinthians 8 and 4. I'm going to just paraphrase. He said, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there's none other God but one. We know that. He said, there's one God, verse 6, by whom are all things and we by him. But Then he says in verse 7, everybody don't know that. For some with conscience of this idol unto this hour, in some of them's mind, that's the Antichrist. You got me? And when they see you eat it, they're seeing it as meat offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Here we go. The Corinthian church had assumed the posture of, well, that's their problem. I'm not going to eat vegetables because they can't break free from their past. I'm not the dummy that used to worship fake gods. They need to just learn what the truth is and start doing it the right way, bless God, because we kind of like eating this meat. Don't care if it causes them a problem or not. And the truth was, they were violating the law of God, not the one about eating the meat offered to idols, but because they put their own rights above the welfare of a new believer, of a new baby. He says later on in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, I skipped a couple, honey. He said, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The King James Version says, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what we're looking for. The stronger believers were not using their platform for serving, but for reigning. Enforcing their will. One might even question as if they were strong as they thought they were. Or perhaps to switch gears, they weren't as adept at eating meat as they thought they were, but were still on the bottle, spiritually speaking. Yeah. Knowledge without love and wisdom is a perfect opportunity for pride to be born. And when pride rises up, you'll use what you know for destruction rather than edification. 
and you have now become, as the Bible said, a fourfold child of hell. Working for the devil instead of the Lord right in the church house. Come on, somebody. Last lesson we learned that Jesus offended many. I'm going to lay down our rights and we're fixing to bring it home. He didn't concern himself. Jesus did not concern himself with people being offended in the process of him obeying and adhering to his calling. But he never offended anybody demanding his own way or demanding his own rights. The liberty we've been issued is not for personal gain. God does not anoint you so everybody will brag on you. God does not call you so everybody will think great things about you or me. He calls us so that the gospel may be preached into the whole world. That's what we're called for. And everything we do has to be pointed in that direction. And brother David, it begins with our attitude. Everything I do on this facility, on the job, everything I do has got to be pointed toward evangelism and salvation. The edification test. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, Romans 14 and 19, the King James, and things wherewith one may edify another. Listen to me now. This is important. That's why I want to get there. Even if what we're doing is permissible by the scriptures. Even if there is not a thou shalt not for what we're doing. We are being called to ask ourselves this question. Am I doing this for the body? Or am I doing this for me? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 23 and 24, 31 through 33. And I'm going to summarize it. Here's what Paul is saying. I can do whatever I want to. Paul said it. But what I want may not be good for the body. Whatever I do, it must be for the glory of God. He said, don't offend anybody. Don't seek for your own building up. But let everything you do be for the cause of the cross which is nothing less than salvation for the whole world. We cannot use what God has given us to elevate ourselves. We better check our want to. We better check our desire. Why do I want to be used of God? Why do I want to be used in the gifts? Why? You know that there may be a strong case to be made that we have a desire to be used for God and he put that desire in us, Sister Maria, but he can't elevate us yet because we don't understand what it means to be great. We really think, Sister Leanne, that it's all about me. When you first come to church, you love everything everybody does. But then when you grow a little bit, ain't it amazing that the more you mature, all of a sudden there's things I don't like no more. The newest rage is to reason it out. Just meditate. You can overcome every doubt. After all, God is a man. They say God is no longer alive, but I still believe in the old rugged cross. You know what that song says? We need to get back to the basics of service, of sacrifice. And if you were there for last Friday morning, that camp meeting, stop running the will of God through your filter of self-preservation. And sacrifice that on the altar. Stand with me. We're going to have revival, folks. We're having revival. We're having revival. But we're learning. And we're growing. The power of the Holy Ghost is moving among us. Amen?
Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, Elements class. If you've never been to Elements, please come at least one time. Please come. We'll set chairs up all around the outside. Elements is incredible. The spirit's incredible. The, the interaction is incredible. I love it. It's one of the best things we've ever done, in my opinion. And it's growing every week. Um, 11 o'clock, worship service. And uh, we're going to have a great time in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Paint parties Friday night. If you signed up, please be there. Saw a good number of names on it for the ladies. Please be there. Have a good time. Have good fellowship. Fun. Paint you a pretty whatever they are. They didn't invite me. I don't have to know. I promise I ain't winning that fight. Yeah. Oh, that's, this is true. This is true. This is true. I don't know who's been talking to Miss Jane, but stop. Whoever's been talking to her about that stuff, stop. I thought I finally had somebody here from with the why stuff that was on my side, but I found out that ain't true. Yeah. Isn't it good to live for God? Amen. Amen. We love you. God bless you. See you all Sunday. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.